Well, one way to answer this is again to n understand that different meditation techniques provide different results. So just like a psychiatrist will give you one medication for one disorder, the Buddha invented a whole plethora of different meditations designed for different uh, reasons. So you can understand that certain meditations provide certain outcomes and knowing what you're dealing with and applying the right antidote will give you a different outcome. And so it's good to know what's available, what you're dealing with and what outcome you want so you know how to, how to practice in the right way. One of the things that's happened in the clinical study of meditation in the last 20 years is that we discovered that one particular technique called mindfulness meditation ends up being really useful for a whole host of psychological and physical disorders. Mindfulness meditation is probably the most studied and, the be and carries the best clinical evidence to support its effectiveness. And it works on a variety of reasons. Mindfulness meditation is a meditation that you use to, you, you calm down you, by focusing your awareness on the breath, but then you open your awareness so that you are experiencing your mind and body in the present moment in, in a non-judgmental, non-interfering, accepting way. And what that does is it short circuits a lot of psychological, emotional, and behavioral reactive habits. If you can provide a calm space to observe and to witness, then you stop the chain reaction in your mind, in your emotional system, and in your, in your behavioral system that ends up causing more problems for you. For example, depressed people, depression is an emotional, uh, is an emotional experience of sadness but it is primarily rooted in a view of oneself as being worthless or unlovable or incapable. And ruminating on that causes tremendous amount of depression. And then when you're depressed, you have a series of behavioral coping mechanisms, like you isolate yourself and you don't go to work and you don't get out of bed and you, know, you don't take good care of yourself and all those kind of things. If you practice mindfulness meditation, what they found is that you can create some space between the story you're telling yourself about yourself. You can kind of begin to see that it's a story. You create, desist, you create distance from just reacting to the story in your mind as if it's real to seeing it as, as a story. So you can kind of hold a space where you can see those thoughts, but they don't necessarily uh, affect you and they don't necessarily push you into reaction. So that. That has been shown to be enormously um, effective for depressed people. The same thing for emotional people, like people that struggle from, from anxiety disorders, for example. What happens in anxiety disorder is that you feel so distressed that it sends you into a panic and you either become paralyzed or you become uh, avoidant of certain situations. So the emotions and the behaviors are linked so quickly that it just it begins to shrink your entire world. What the mindfulness meditation helps people with panic do is to create a space where they can have that emotion and begin to tolerate it without jumping into the reaction mode. And this is really important from the Dalai Lama's perspective because what he said, very interesting, was Western people with the advances in medicine and technology for all the greatness of those advances, what they have also done is that they have limited our ability to tolerate distress. You think about the last time you had a headache, the first thing that you do is reach for the Advil to take it away. And if you have Advil readily available and doctors ready available, and medicine ready available, and technology ready available at any moment that you feel any distress and you reach for it and it takes away your pain, that sounds great, but your ability to deal with difficulty and your ability to deal with distress atrophies. It shrinks. So for all the wonderful, wonderful uh, results we're getting from our technology and our medicine, we are, we are uh, devolving as human beings to deal with distress. So what we're doing with pa patients with anxiety is we're giving them a moment to create a safe, 
healing space within their mind and nervous system to allow themselves to feel distress without freaking out. And what that does is it grows their capacity because, let's face it, life is going to be challenging. Distress isn't going to go away. We're never going to create a perfect environment. The best that we can do is develop our capacity to deal with that stuff. And that's what the mindfulness is doing, is sort of expanding your nervous system's capability so that you can tolerate it without freaking out. And then there, you know, the behavioral, the way of dealing with behaviors is too, they show with people with addictions, for example, or eating disorders, when they feel any kind of distress, the knee-jerk response is to go for a coping mechanism like alcohol or drugs to take it away. Again, this meditation is uncoupling or separating the negative affect from the adverse behavior so that you can have space to choose an alternative. If you calm your do mind down enough and you watch yourself quietly and calmly and you give yourself training time over time to adjust or adapt, you give yourself a choice at some point not to just go for the alcohol, but now you can go for the phone call and maybe call a sponsor or maybe call a friend to talk about how you're feeling rather than quickly bury it. But these are ways that the mindfulness meditation are helping people with, you know, disturbances of, on a cognitive level, disturbances on an affective or emotional level and behavioral level. And that's just one meditation studied over the last 20 years. Now, what's the next step? The next step are in the research right now is studying compassion and love practices. You know, all the rage right now is studying these Avads yogis that have like hundreds of thousands of hours of developing love and compassion and what happens in their brain. And I think that that is, that is the new terrain that uh, clinical psychology and meditation research is going to go into the, into the next frontier of those set of compassion and love practices. And then finally after that, there's this l really obscure camp of meditation practices that are very unique to the t Tibetan tradition, which are the visualizations. And the visualizations are designed to use your imagination and your brain's ability to uh, creatively design a safe healing environment so that you can transcend your fixation to your story about who you think you are and what this world is about. Right now, I'm a traumatized little person separated from the world, and it's a scary world out there. And the visualization practices are going to help us pull us out of the fixation to see that we're an actually enlightened heroes. We're already free. We're like Buddhas, all of us. And this isn't a crazy world with shrinking resources and ice caps melting. What it is is like a paradise. And if you imagine that, just like a pilot entering into a flight simulator, even though there are no real uh, planes that he's chasing, his brain doesn't know the difference. A pilot in a flight simulator, his brain doesn't know the difference between what is imagined and what is real. But what he does is he does train in a kind of experience. So what the visualizations do is they train us to let go or disarm from our traumatized, alienated sense of self so that we can feel happier and free. And with that different nervous system, we can then relate to the environment in a different way and we can actually create a new environment. So it's basically using creativity and imagination to trick us into thinking that we're freer and safer because the mind that's freer and safer will actually construct a different reality. It's quite amazing. It's coming. We'll, we're going to learn a lot more about it. And uh, through the continued dialogue between the Dalai Lama and his Tibetan monks that are practicing those visualization techniques, one day we'll get a really good handle on those, those uh, amazing, amazing uh, tools and technologies. Ooh.